Well, good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's is, that is better. That's how we do it. So, uh, and it's good to be here this morning. It is good to be in God's house with God's people. It's good to hear His praises Amen. being sung and his, uh, his name being lifted up. That's what it's all about. Um, not necessarily being in this place, but lifting up the name of Jesus together as God's people. And, uh, and that's, that's what, uh, what we have come here to do this morning. And that's what I pray when we leave here, that we will leave here to do. To take that attitude of worship and that attitude of, of praise with us uh, through our whole week. Because how many of y'all know, this is, just, this is just the beginning of the week. We're, we're 11 hours into the week and we've got 155 hours to go. And, uh, and this, is, this is the start, but let's not let it be the end. Let's take this, take the Holy Spirit with us. The Holy, the, you know, the Bible promises that the Holy Spirit's going to go with us and He is going to, He is living in us and He is going with us. But let's be mindful of that as we go about our, our week um, this week. So uh, I do want to encourage you if you're... Uh, uh, visiting with us this morning. Maybe you've been coming for a little while. Maybe this is your first Sunday. Uh, if you don't mind, we, we, uh, we are honored that you have chosen to worship with us. We consider you our VIPs. And if you don't mind, maybe taking that card uh, in the seat in front of you, giving us a way that we can get in contact with you. We'd love to, to get in contact with you, just uh, get to know you a little bit better. Um, we just, uh, we're honored that you've chosen to worship with us this morning and then we'd like to, you know, maybe take you out for coffee or something like that so that, uh, we can get to know you better and, and that you can get to know more about the church, maybe get plugged in if this is where God is leading you to get plugged in. Let's go ahead and pray and then we're going to get into the message this morning and see what God has to say to us through his word. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you are good and that you love us. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that you walk with us through life's trials and through life's struggles, that even when we sin, even when we, we turn our backs on you, you are faithful and you never turn your back on us. So Lord, we just pray that you would help us to be mindful of your presence with us, that you would help us to be, to, be, to be mindful of the implications of your word on our daily lives. Help us to follow you and live our lives in a way that glorifies you and that lifts you up. And it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. An NBA coach one time asked a referee, he said, are there any words that I could say to you that regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the context, regardless of what's going on, is there any word that I could say to you that's so bad that would get me automatically ejected no matter what? And the referee replied, yes, there is one. And so the coach asked, well, what is it? And the referee replied, the word is you. The word you automatically is going to get you ejected. And the coach was confused for a minute. And he's like, I don't understand. What do you mean? And the referee replied, he said, you can say whatever you need to say to make yourself feel better. It doesn't bother me. You can say whatever you need to say. But the moment you start saying it to me or about me, then we've got a problem. And this is something that I think we all instinctively understand to one degree or another. There's a big difference between things that are done in the heat of the moment and things that are done intentionally. You know, it doesn't make the, the things that are done in the heat of the moment. That still is sin and that still is wrong. That still offends God's heart and separates us from God. But at least on a human level, there's, there's, there we feel differently about things that are done to us in the heat of the moment. We feel differently about that person that says something that they ought not to say uh, in, in a moment of passion when, when everything's going crazy than, about, than, than we feel about the person who with intentionality and flagrantly is, is trying to hurt us. And, and, and so we feel differently about those things. And today we're going to deal with two people who are solidly in the second category. These two people committed the greatest sin that we could ever imagine. And the thing is, they, they did it on purpose, right? This wasn't a moment of weakness. This wasn't a, a mistake. This was wholesale rebellion against God. They declared war on God, and they knew exactly what they were doing. These two guys, Judas on one hand and Peter on the other hand, they betrayed Jesus intentionally and flagrantly. And the thing is, they had lived in a privileged position in life. They were one of his 12 disciples. They were, there was only 10 other guys in all of human history that shared the position that, that Judas and Peter had. They walked with Jesus. 
They, they knew the Son of God personally. They heard His teachings. They saw His miracles. And yet both of them betrayed Him and they turned their backs on Him when it seemed that He needed him, them most. And I understand Jesus is the Son of God. And, and he didn't really need them. But, but from a human perspective, those moments when, when we're struggling and when we're suffering, that's when we need our friends with us. When everything's going along okay, we can do all right. But those moments, how many of y'all know that when, when you're suffering, when you're struggling, that's when you need those people to gather around you and to be with you. And, and so from a human perspective, we know that Jesus is the Son of God, that he had God's strength, and he wasn't in need of Peter or Judas. But from a human perspective, that's the most important time in Jesus's life. He's getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to literally to change the world. And they abandon him and they betray him. John MacArthur wrote, this is what makes their treachery so appalling. They knew him. They walked with him. And that's what will make Judas's punishment so severe. He was with Christ, but he never really saw him. John MacArthur also wrote, Judas may be the greatest example of wasted opportunity in human history. Right? He, and you can see why. He walked with Jesus. He lived with him for, for three years. He heard his teachings. He saw the miracles. He may have even participated in, in some of the miracles. But he never really saw who Jesus was. He never really understood who Jesus was and what Jesus had come to do. And at this point in the story, we're here in Mark chapter 14, verse 66. Now we know, most of us know how Peter's life ends up. But at this point in the story, if we can kind of just for a second chuck what we know about the rest of Peter's life after this moment... At this point in the story, it looks like Peter's life is going to end, is going to be another example, the, the, the other greatest example of wasted opportunity in history. Because it looks like Peter is right there with Judas, that he's going down the same road. And in fact, what we're going to find out, if it wasn't for one little ten-letter word, and I'm going to let you know what that ten-letter word is in a few minutes, but if it wasn't for this one little ten-letter word, Peter would have ended up in the same place that Judas did. Condemned, cut off for all eternity. As Jesus said, it would have been better had Judas never been born. And the same, it seems like, was at this point, might also be true of Peter. So let's take one more look at the scripture. I want to go ahead and read it again. I know Pastor Ryan just read it, but, but let's read one more time. And uh, let's read God's word together. Mark chapter 14, verse 66 through 72. And I want to say a quick word before we jump into the scripture. Some of y'all may have noticed we kind of skipped over Mark chapter 13. And, and that's in, intentional. We're not skipping Mark 13. We're going back because it's important and it's God's word. But at this point in the, uh, in the series, you know, we're looking at the life of Jesus kind of through the eyes of the disciples. We're seeing how Jesus called people around him and, and to, to, in one way or another, to live lives that were greater than themselves and to live lives that live beyond themselves. Mark chapter 13, Jesus kind of, the, the, the gospel writer kind of takes a, a, just a slight little break. Mark takes a slight little break from, from the story of Jesus and he puts in a large section on Jesus' teachings on the end times. And what we want to do, rather than kind of just try to stuff that into to how we've been teaching through the gospel of Mark so far, what we want to do is we've kind of skipped from chapter 12 to chapter 14 and then we're going to come back hopefully uh, toward, toward the beginning of next year, we're going to come back and look in depth at Mark chapter 13 and do, try to do it the justice that it deserves and really look in depth for several weeks at Jesus' teachings on the end times and the, and the end and, and, and how uh, he was going to return and going to set up his kingdom and going to set everything right again. So just if you've noticed that, I just wanted to let you know about that. We, we really do believe at Bridge 42 in teaching expositorily from God's Word. What that means is, is instead of uh, coming up with our ideas and going to the scriptures to kind of prove our ideas and our points, we, 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 want, we, we desire and we really strive to go to the scripture and pull out what is, what is God trying to say to us through these scriptures. And so one of the things that we do, and, and, and there are times that we take breaks from this, but, when, but one of the things that we do as we're going along, generally we try to look at a book of the Bible and go through that book of the Bible or look at certain chapters out of a book in the Bible and go through that rather than rather than because it takes me out of the equation you know it's not up to me to figure out what I want to speak on it's not up to me to figure out you know what what scriptures am I going to use we go with what what God says and then and, and we need to what we need to do is you know all of us in all of our lives we need to try to take ourselves out of the equation as much as possible so I just wanted to let you know that we are going to go back 
at Mark chapter 13, and we are going to try to do justice to those passages and explore Jesus' teachings on the end times, um, but, but we're probably going to do that at a later time, hopefully uh, this winter, maybe this spring, and, and do that. So, Mark chapter 14, verse 66 through 72. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it, and after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. And what we need to do this morning, we need to look at a few misconceptions about Peter's betrayal of Jesus. The first misconception is this was not an isolated event. You know, we kind of have this idea. We have this, this idea that this event was like out of character for Peter. And, and it was to an extent. But, but, but we have this idea like Peter is this great apostle and he's just, you know, the, the greatest thing since sliced bread to ever walk, except for Jesus, to ever walk the earth. And, he, you know, his feet didn't touch the ground. And he walked through life, you know, spoken a King James accent, that kind of thing. And we have this idea, and, and, and something happened on this night, and for like an hour, like Satan possessed him or something, and, and he's just totally out of character. And then verse 72 happens, he realizes what he had done, he breaks down and weeps, and it's back to the same old Peter again. And when we do that, I think we miss some of the point of, of this story, and we miss some of the point of, of Peter's life here. To be sure, Peter loved Jesus. Peter followed Jesus. Peter was committed to a Jesus to Jesus in a way that Judas never was. Peter knew Jesus. He was with Christ, in Christ, not just in the sense of physically P Judas was with Christ, but Peter, Peter was, he had put his faith in Christ. And so his salvation was never in doubt. But, but these events also weren't necessarily out of character for him. And, and, and that, that goes to our lives as well. You know, those of us who know Christ, we've committed ourselves to Christ. We've put all of our faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. And we are committed to Jesus in a way that those around us who don't know Jesus will, will never be unless they come to know Jesus. But how many of y'all know that sometimes sin is, is still there? Sin is not necessarily out of character for us yet. It's becoming more and more out of character as we walk close, more closely and closely with Jesus. But it's still, we're still struggling with that sin in our lives. And Peter's in the same place. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. We look at that. We'll go back a little bit here. Kind of look at the pattern of Peter's life up to this point. And you, you remember this, this passage. This is where Jesus asked the disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter was the first one to speak up. The first one, the first time a, a human being answered this question correctly in the Gospel of Mark. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And in verse 31 it says, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes <clears throat> and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And so Peter said, may it be as you have said, Lord, I will submit to your will, right? No. Since Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. In fact, Peter started getting so loud with him that Jesus had to call him Satan to get him to stop, right? So Jesus is explaining what all this means. Yes, you've correctly identified me as the Son of God, but the Son of God must be handed over to the scribes and the chief priests and be killed. And Peter said, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. That's not the way you need to do it. You, this, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. The problem isn't that Peter didn't understand. The problem was that he was convinced that Peter's way, not Jesus' way, was the best. Fast forward to Mark chapter 14. We look at this, uh, looked at this a few weeks ago. When Mary comes in and she's got the, the, the perfume, the expensive ointment, and she breaks it over, over Jesus and, and anoints his body for burial. And basically, I mean, she wastes Honestly, from a human perspective, she wastes it. It was very expensive, worth probably tens of thousands of dollars in today's, in today's money. <clears throat> and it says in verse 4, in Mark 14, it says, 
And there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? This ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. Now those of you who, who are Bible scholars, you might be saying, well, look, the Gospel of John identifies it as Judas who was saying this, and that's true. But Matthew says that it was some of the disciples. So, so my best guess is, and, and I am guessing here, but, but I, th I think this is a pretty solid um, guess according to what the, what the Scripture says. What it looks like is that Judas was kind of the ringleader, but that the other disciples were kind of chiming in and joining in as well. And if we know something about Peter in a situation like this, Peter didn't keep his mouth shut. You know, Peter, Peter was a loud guy. He talked a lot, kind of like me. And, and, uh, and so if this is happening, Peter, I'm sure, had an opinion about it. And, and it doesn't say that, that the disciples were disagreeing. It says that some of the disciples were saying that, uh, that, that, that were scolding her. And so, so we, it's, I think it's pretty safe to assume here that Peter was at least participating in, in this. Again, my way, not Jesus' way. That doesn't make sense. Why would you waste that? Seems like to me you should give the, to me you should give the money, you should sell it and give the money to the poor. Fast forward to Mark chapter 14, verse 47. They're in the garden at this point. Mark chapter 14 starts off um, the night before Jesus was arrested. And uh, they, uh, the, the Mary comes in, anoints his body with the perfume. And then it, it fast forward to the next evening and they're eating the Lord's Supper. This is what we talked about last week. Jesus institutes communion, the new Passover. Um, kind of lets everything out of the bag, bag, sets everything into motion of what he's going to do. And then uh, Judas at this point leaves and goes off to the, to the chief priest to, to work out this plot to, to have him arrested. And Jesus takes the remaining 11 disciples. They go into the garden. He leaves eight of them behind at the entrance to the garden. He, he and James and John go a little, and Peter go a little bit farther, leaves James, John, and Peter behind. And he goes a little bit farther by himself to pray. And he tells Peter, James, and John to watch and pray with me. Right? And, and in Mark chapter 14, verse 37 and 38, it says, He came to them and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And this is where Jesus calls it out. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we see it uh, ten, 10 verses later in Mark chapter 14, verse 47. Even after Jesus has, has called it out. It says, because they come to arrest Jesus. And Jesus has already told him time and again, I'm going to be arrested and handed over to sinful men. This must happen. This is, this is good. This is what should happen. And what's Peter doing? Verse 47, it says, but one of those who stood by, and the Gospel of John identifies him as Peter, drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Again, Peter's my way, not Jesus' way. This doesn't make sense to me. I want to do it my way, not your way. And so Peter calls him out in verse 37. He says, he, he says, the spirit is willing, <clears throat> but the flesh is weak. You don't understand. You don't get it. You insist on having your way. You're not even willing to pray with me. But and you don't understand that this is to your benefit. I don't, I'm, I'm Jesus. I don't need this. Right? I know he's going to bear the full wrath of God on the cross. He's going to the cross. The Bible said he's sweating drops of blood. He's in such anguish in the garden. But he doesn't need this. He's Jesus. He's got the power and the strength of God with him. Peter's the one that needs the prayers. Pray with me, he's saying. I don't need it. You do. You're about to be tested. You're about to fall farther than you could ever imagine because you don't have the strength to stand. Look at the pattern of your life so far. The Spirit is willing. It is. You saw who I was. You spoke up. You said I was the Christ. You sat with me at the Last Supper. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Time and time again, you're getting tripped up, the f up, 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 up by the flesh. You're getting tripped up by what you think, by what you want, by what you feel. And that's about to bring you down, so you better start praying with me because you need it. I don't need it. You need it. And what we see when we look at the pattern of Peter's life is that Peter's fall didn't, didn't start when the servant girl came up. Peter's fall didn't even start when he, when he entered into the courtyard of the high priest. Peter's fall started probably days, maybe months earlier. Peter's life 
didn't get turned away from God in this moment temporarily. We know he came back. We know that a true, a true believer is never going to fall permanently away from God. But Peter's life didn't get turned away from God at this point by some earth-shaking event. It was just a little servant girl. She was probably a teenager. Peter was a big fisherman, man. He could have taken her. I'm pretty sure. I'm, I probably could have even taken her. But how many of us are getting tripped up by the servant girls in our lives? How many of us are getting tripped up by the, the little things? Guys who struggle with lust, your, your fall doesn't start when you're sitting at the computer late at night. It starts when you wake up in the morning without seeking the Lord. It starts when you notice that woman at the office the day before and you don't, you don't do anything about it. Or when you stay up after the rest of your family has gone to bed, you knowing, not, never, not, not intending to go there, but knowing that you struggle and knowing where you might end up. And by the time the servant girl shows up, by the time the temptation shows up, you've already lost the battle. You know, people that struggle with being impatient, with anger, with, with, with being short with people. Maybe women that are, uh, women that struggle with, with being impatient towards your children. Or, or, or you struggle with being impatient towards somebody in your family that's it's hard to deal with. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. 90% of you, somebody's face just popped into your mind right then. Right? Somebody at work who, who's driving you crazy, right? You struggle with that. Your fall doesn't begin when you start flipping out on these people. It starts when you wake up in the morning without taking a few minutes with yourself and the Lord. It starts when you, rec when you don't recognize that you can't do it alone. It starts when you buy into the idea that nobody else understands what you're going through, that your struggles are so big that nobody else, nobody else gets it, nobody else understands that. We're going to explore that idea in a few weeks and, uh, and see that that's one of the biggest lies that the devil tells us, that, that, that no, nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody's, that's a lie. Specifically, you know, some of the moms, you're, you're raising young kids and it's hard. I know it's hard. And, 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 you know, maybe your, your fall begins when you isolate yourself from other adults, when it's just you and the kids all the time. And by the time you get to the point where the kids are tearing up the house, or by the time you get to the point where the guy at work says something that causes you to go off the handle, or, or your mother-in-law, you know, does what they do, and, <laughs> or that person in your family, and I'm not, By the time the servant girl shows up, you've already lost the battle. You lost it weeks ago. You lost it that morning. And that's what happened with Peter. By the time the servant girl walks up, the battle's already over. He's already lost. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He lost it hours earlier in the garden, if not before. So, number one, Peter's, Peter's uh, uh, betrayal was not an isolated event. Number two, Peter's betrayal was not a little thing. Again, we kind of have this idea that, yeah, what Peter did was a sin. It was bad, but it wasn't that big of a deal. It, it wasn't, certainly wasn't as bad as what Judas did. You know, even the terms that we use, Judas betrayed Jesus, but Peter what? Peter denied Jesus. That's not, that's not good, but it's not as bad. It's not as bad as betraying, right? So, but, but again, we kind of, we, we miss the point when we do this. And Peter's sin was a big deal. He did betray Jesus almost to the extent that, that Judas did. Verse 68, if you look at it, verse 68, he says, I do not know nor understand what you're talking about. In the Greek, it literally means, I do not know nor do I know about what you are saying, which sounds a little bit confusing, but there's two different words for no. He's, he's saying, I, I, I don't know this guy. I don't know what you're talking about, nor do I even like have any clue about like, where am I? I don't even know what's going on here. I don't know. Who is this Jesus how you say Jesus that you speak of. He's like going way over the top here. Right? Verse 71. The, the next time it says he begins to, I like how the ESV puts it because the, the King James uh, says he begins to curse and to swear, which is absolutely, um, probably actually more grammatically correct translation from the Greek. But the, the ESV gives it a little bit of an explanation to, because when we think cursing and swearing in our day and age, we think that he launches into a string of profanity or something like that. But that's not what he was doing. It says that, that uh, 
In, in, in the ESV, it says that he begins to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. And that really, that really gets the idea across because, again, the Greek literally means to make oaths and to make oaths, which, again, it sounds a bit strange, but it's two different kinds of oath. The first type of oath, the swearing, is your typical kind of oath. I swear by heaven or whatever you, whatever you might say I, I do. You know, when you go down to the courthouse, I swear or affirm that, you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the first thing. But the second is much more serious. The Greek word is anathematizo. You might want to try saying that, anathematizo. Let's see how we can do. That was good. <coughs> anathematizo. And what that means, it literally means to devote to destruction. Basically, he's saying, may I be forever devoted to destruction. May I forever burn in hell if I'm lying. That's what he's saying. And that's a big deal, especially, you know, in the first century Jewish mind. That was a big deal for them because words meant something in that culture. They, they were, there was no like, oh, well, he's just talking. There was, words were powerful in their, in their minds and in their culture. The only other time that word anathematizo is used in the New Testament's is in Acts 23. It's a group of men who had just gotten to the point where they were just so rebellious against God. They were they were they they invoked a curse on themselves. They anathematized themselves. That's probably not how you're really supposed to use it, but they used that word saying, "May I be forever to be devoted. May I be forever devoted to destruction if they didn't stop Paul from what the apostle Paul was doing." And so what we see here is that Peter had completely fallen. He was literally willing to devote his soul to eternal destruction to convince these people that he didn't know Jesus because most first century Jews, probably including Peter at this point, would have thought that since he swore this oath in this way that he was now lost without any hope of salvation. Now we're about to find out as Peter's about to find out that that's not the case, that there is nowhere that you can go that God, as the book of Isaiah says, the arm of the Lord is not short that he cannot save. There is nowhere that you can fall that you have fallen too far for God but at this point in Peter's mind he's probably beginning to think that like I have completely fallen I, there, I cannot go any lower and you know that doesn't sound like the Peter that we learned about in Sunday school does it the Peter that stood strong and he did that the Peter that spoke loudly that acted boldly the Peter that fought hard certainly wouldn't be afraid of a little servant girl but you know, that Peter had the tendency also to do things in his own strength. You remember in the garden how he wasn't willing to pray? Remember how he wasn't willing to seek intimacy with God? He wasn't willing to seek direction or strength from God? Remember how the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? And in the end, something so simple, so small, so weak, tripped him up. How many great godly men have ended up being tripped up by things that seemed so simple? And so small. How many, how many great men have, have preached to thousands, have seen thousands of people saved in their ministries, and it all comes crashing down because they got a little too close to a woman that they weren't married to? How many great godly men like, like Peter have, have seen amazing things happen in their lives, have built churches with thousands of people that see hundreds of people baptized every, every quarter, and they, and they come crashing down because they skimmed a couple hundred dollars off the church budget? You know, in the end, sometimes something so simple and so small, it brought down Peter and it can do the same for us. And we're getting ready to find out that, yeah, it can, it can bring you down. But no matter how far it brings you down, that, that, that there's no place that God can't reach you. But, but how much destruction sometimes can the little things, can the servant girls do in our life? <clears throat> the Winchester family in the 1800s built their fortune on the Winchester rifle. They became very rich and very powerful. They lived in a beautiful house. They had everything that the world could offer until William Win Winchester, the owner of the company, died in 1881. And his widow, Sarah Winchester, inherited $20 million in 1881. I mean, imagine how much money that was in 1881. $20 million. Plus, that's not all, plus an annual income of $730,000 a year. In 1881... I mean, I think I could probably, I, mean, I could get by on 730 grand a year in today's money, you know. <laughs> Don't you think so? I mean, probably, I think I could get by, right? We could probably all together get by on that, <laughs> right? Shortly after this, she visited a psychic medium in Boston who convinced her that the ghosts of all of the people killed by the Winchester rifles wanted their revenge on her. 
And by 1884, she was so convinced that this was true, and she was convinced that the only way to stop them was to make sure that they wouldn't be able to find her. She was so convinced of that, this that she hired a construction team to work around the clock, adding on to her house so that the ghosts would get lost and not be able to find her. This is true. The house still stands today. You can actually go visit. It's in California. By the time she died in 1922, she had wasted almost all of her family fortune, adding on over 700 rooms to the house. She had trap doors. She had doors that opened up into blank walls. She had staircases that led to nowhere. They just lead up to the top of the wall, and there was nothing up there. She had, uh, there was hallways that were like twisty and turny and up and down, all designed to try to get the ghosts to, uh, to, to be confused so they wouldn't be able to find her. And this great family fortune, almost half a billion dollars in today's money, was wasted. And what caused this to happen? She believed a lie. One little lie. I mean, how much did that visit to the psychic cost her? Maybe 20 bucks, 30 bucks, I don't know, a few hundred dollars in today's money. But how much did it really cost her? It cost her everything. It cost her the, the family fortune. Because she believed it. Peter found this same truth out. It doesn't take much. Just a little servant girl. And that's because sin is never content to coexist with righteousness. That's on the, on the screen. Sin is never content to coexist with righteousness. Sin never gets to the point where it says, all right, I got him sinning four times a day, so like, I'm good now. No, it, it always comes. Sin never comes to coexist. It always comes to conquer. And as Peter found out, it will always take you farther than you wanted to go. It will always cost you more than you wanted to pay. But also, as Peter found out, you haven't fallen too far. You can't out -sin the grace of God. And that's, that's number three, the third thing that we need to see about Peter. Peter's fall is that the, the difference between Peter and Judas really has nothing to do with their sin, but it has everything to do with their response to their sin. Look at where they ended up. It'd be hard to find two people whose lives ended up more differently. Peter ended up being the rock on which Jesus built his church. Judas ended up in despair, ending his own life, and ended up condemned by God in hell for all eternity. But you take a closer look and you see that although it's difficult to find two people who ended up in more different places, it's also difficult to find two people whose lives and whose stories had more similarities. Both walked with Jesus. Both were one of the 12 disciples. That narrows it down to 12 right there. Both saw the miracles and the healings. Both likely participated in some of the miracles. Both men heard Jesus' teachings. Both were with him on the night that he was arrested. Both had an opportunity to betray him. Both men seized that opportunity. Both men unflinchingly faced the realization that their actions could cause them to become eternally condemned by God, yet both of them embraced their sin with abandon. Both men came to the realization of what they had done, and both were heartbroken over their sin. How could it be that these two men had such different outcomes? What's the difference? And like I said before, it's one ten-letter word. It's repentance. The difference is not in the nature of their crimes. And the difference between us in this room when it comes down to us, because when it comes down to it, because sin is sin, and all sin separates us from God. The difference between us in this room and the worst sinner in, in our minds that's ever walked the face of the earth is not so much in the nature of our crimes, but it's in repentance. It's that those of us who know Christ, we've turned from our sin and we've put our hope in the gospel. Amen. And that's what Peter did, and that's what Judas never did. Look at, let's look at Judas' response real quick. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 through 5. It says, And when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So he was sorry. He realized he'd done something wrong, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What's that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed. And he went and hanged himself. Just something real quick. This wasn't in my notes, but just something really, really quick. It's interesting. And this kind of goes more to us, like leaders and elders and teachers and that kind of stuff. Like, we have a big influence over people in this area. He went to the, to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He went to the religious leaders. And he said, I've sinned. Help me. And they said, I'm sorry. They said, what's that to us? Go see to it yourself. You're guilty. That's not what we need to be doing, man. 
That's not what we need to be doing. But Judas recognized what he had done. And it drove him to despair. He realized where he stood with God. He realized that he was condemned. Judas understood that his sin was responsible for the death of God's son. And when we think about it, our sin is what sent Jesus to the cross. Just like Judas, maybe not as directly as Judas. It might not be as easy a connection to make as Judas' sin being responsible for the death of Christ. But our sin sent Jesus to the cross too. Our sin is responsible for the death of God's son. But Judas let that fact drive him to despair. But Peter's response was different. Just like Judas, Peter recognized his sin. Verse 72, it says he wept over his sin. He recognized his standing before God. He recognized that apart from Jesus, he stood condemned before a holy God. But instead of letting this drive to him to despair, it drove him to the cross. He turned to Jesus. He repented. And while Judas let his guilt lead him despair, to despair and ultimately to death. Peter's guilt led him to repentance and ultimately to life. And some of you this morning, this is the part you need to hear. I don't have to tell you that you're a sinner. I don't have to tell you that your sin has separated you from God. I don't have to tell you that you stand at a place of being an enemy of God because of your sin. You get that fact. You know it instinctively. You feel it in the depths of your soul. What you need to hear is that there's still hope for you this morning. That you haven't fallen too far. That you have not out God's grace. Even Peter hadn't. He walked with Jesus for three years. And then he betrayed him. But he hadn't fallen too far. And if Peter hadn't fallen too far, you haven't either. Origen, he was a uh, church father that lived in the second century, just one of the, uh, after the apostles, they called the next couple of generations of leaders in the church, the church fathers. And he was uh, one of these second century leaders. And he said, after all these things, Christ still receives his own murderers. He closes his church to no one. He closes his church to no one. Some of you have a choice to make this morning. The rooster is crowing and you're guilty. You did it. You're condemned. You're God's enemies. There's no escaping it. Some of you this morning, you are Christians. You're not condemned, but you are guilty. You have fallen away from, from the grace. Not in the sense that you're in danger of losing your salvation, but you've fallen away from, from where God wants you to be. And you've fallen in, back into sin again. Something's not right. Deep down inside of you, you know it. You might not be willing to admit it to anybody else. You might not even be willing to admit it to yourself. But deep down inside, it's nagging at you. Something's not right. You're not right with God. And instinctively, we know this. I mean, you turn on the news. You turn on the TV. You, you look at what's going on in the world. We know that there's something wrong. There's something flawed about humanity. That we are somehow separated from God. So what are we going to do? You could just sit in your sin. You could wallow in it. You could despair in it like Judas did. You could let it snuff out the last remaining embers of life that are smoldering in your heart. Or you could run back to Jesus. And this applies to, to you whether you're, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian. It applies a little bit differently. But if you're not a Christian, obviously you know, you're separated from God and you need to come to Jesus to be redeemed and to be reconciled to him. And if you are a Christian, you're not separated from God. Your, your standing with, with Jesus is secure. You are right with God, but that fellowship with God can be broken. And you can feel that despair and you can feel that guilt and you can feel that regret, sometimes just as strongly as somebody who's not a Christian. And the answer is, is really the same, is repentance. Run back to Jesus. That's the difference. Peter and Judas ended up in very different positions, not because their sin was so different, but because the response to their sin was so different. Peter embraced God's forgiveness offered to anyone who repents, and Judas experienced God's wrath poured out on those who refused. Let me say that again. Peter embraced God's forgiveness offered to anyone who repents, and Judas experienced God's wrath poured out on those who refuse. You know, you can't go back and change what you've done. Um, put on the sign, I put on Facebook this morning, 
you know, you're struggling with guilt, you're struggling with regret. A lot of us are. A lot of us have regrets. We all have regrets. I have things that I regret. I have things I wish I could go back and change. But I can't do it. It's already happened. It's over with. But I can change how I respond to what I've done. I can choose to embrace condemnation like Judas did, or I can embrace mercy like Peter did. Put on the, uh, the sign this morning, the fine line between ruin and redemption. And that's repentance. The space between ruin and redemption is filled by repentance. And so this morning, we're going to have an opportunity to respond to God's word. We're going to have an opportunity to respond to what he's done. Uh, we're going to pray now, and we're going to have the altar is going to be open. Uh, you can come and, and, and just offer yourself to Jesus. Repent. If there's something that you need to turn from, just be thankful for his grace. You can sit where you're at in your seat. You know there's nothing special about this particular geographical location right here. You can stay right in your seat because God's Holy Spirit is, is right there. It's, if you're a believer this morning, he is, is inside of you, indwelling you. And if you're not a believer this morning, he is waiting for that to happen. He's waiting. He's wanting you to turn to him so that he can come and indwell you um, because you turn to Jesus. We're going to have communion available. Wes and the guys are going to be playing a, a song. So just take these next few minutes and respond to God however he is leading you to respond to him this morning.